So for today's event, it will be taking place in three acts. And there are two main characters in our program. First, from the University of Edinburgh School of Philosophy, Psychology and Language Sciences and the Lothian Birth Cohort is Research Fellow Judy Oakley, who will be sharing with us her research into how music affects our body and mind. Bringing in the musical element of today's program and demonstrating many instruments, including a variety of serpents and many instruments from our Musical Instrument Museum, is Tony George, who is a professor of Ophiclide and Serpent at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. So let's get started and I'm going to pass over to Judy. Thanks so much, Sarah, for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us. It's so nice to see you all here this evening. And I, I'm so impressed by all the, the different parts of, of the UK and beyond everyone is joining us from today. It's brilliant. And it's the really nice thing about being online. Um, so I'd actually like, uh, I should introduce myself first. So I'm Judy and I'm a, a researcher in psychology. And I've recently become really interested in music as a, as a topic of, of research. Um, so I'd just like to start um, the event by asking you all a question that you can respond to in the chat. Um, so can you give me one example of, of when you might listen to music or why you listen to music? Um, so just a, a few words. So for example, I listen to music to help me relax. And we'll, we'll come back to your answers in a wee bit. Um, but I'll, I'll carry on in the meantime, but do feel free to, to keep typing your answers. Um, so music, as many of you I'm sure know, is part of our everyday lives. And even if we're not musicians ourselves, we all have musical abilities. So for example, when we hear someone playing an instrument or hear a song on the radio, we all feel compelled to move in time to the beat. So that might be just tapping our foot or moving our whole bodies, depending on, on who we are and the context. Um, so we used to think that this was an ability that was unique to humans, um, but some researchers think that some animals might also have this ability. Uh, so one example is the parrot. Um, so you could, there's some great videos on YouTube of parrots dancing to music. So parrots might respond similarly to music as humans do. Um, but as well as all being musical beings, I think we're all music psychologists as well, because we use music to help us in different ways. Um, so I'm now going to go over to Barbara, and can you can you read us some examples from the chat um, that we're getting? Hello, everyone. Um, we are getting some really um, interesting comments um, and examples of how we enjoy music or where we enjoy music. So there are a few, um, for, for a few of us, um, we listen to music to relax, um, from Luis, um, when driving, gardening, um, as I enjoy listening to music, relax, but also study um, to wake me up in the morning um, while exercising, um, to make the background not so empty when I'm alone. Um, that's a lovely one um, for enjoyment and, and study, to relax, get motivated. Um, so there are all sorts of different contexts. Um, some of us um, play uh, instruments. So we have a comment from Debbie. I play in a brass band and music feeds my soul. Um, that's lovely. And I'm sure that we will, um, we can come back to other comments later um, as we listen to um, Judy and Tony um, during the, the event. Oh, so back to Judy. Thanks so much, Barbara. That was a great summary and some really fascinating responses. So really different contexts from kind of dealing with emotions to exercising. Um, yeah, so music is, is useful in so many different ways, as well as just being enjoyable uh, for its own, you know, for its own purposes. Um, so music making is found in all societies and in our very earliest histories. Um, and we have developed many different ways of making musical instruments depending on the, the materials that we have available to us. Um, so I'm now going to pass back over to Tony and Sarah, and Tony will begin by telling us about that's the natural. natural. Thanks very much, that's, it. that's a really good introduction. So we're going to start off with the most natural instrument of all, which of course is your voice. So forever, humans have been able to use their voice to both communicate with 
and to sing songs. Now, an extension of the voice is it's not that loud. So humans have always been searching for things which are louder. One of the first things they found was this. Now, when humans first left the, the lands of Africa, they would tend to go along by the sea because there's always food next to the sea. Now, one of the bits of food is this, which is called a conch. And inside lives a really big conch. And uh, it, it tastes very nice with some garlic butter, I have to say. But anyway, to play the instrument, the, the conch dies, falls out. And you can imagine someone picking one of these off many, many tens of thousands of years ago and blowing into it and seeing what happens. Now you can hear that that's quite a loud sound and it carries a long way. But you can also alter the sound as well. provide not just shells, but they provide other things as well. So you can imagine the person walking along next to the sea, seeing the conch shell, blown it and thinks, oh, what else should I play? And then looks to a field and sees an animal horn and thinks, ah, I can blow that now. Let's see if that's any louder. So this is an African animal horn. It sounds a bit like this. <laughs> This is even louder because it's a longer tube to resonate with. Here we go, let's hear that again. But now, because it's a longer tube, you've got more notes. Humans worked out how to use various types of metal to make instruments. Then you have natural instruments. By a natural instrument, that's an instrument without any keys or valves to change the sound. So fast forward a few more tens of thousands of years, you get to Greek times, where if you were a part of the Olympic Games, you were announced as you walked on to compete by a trumpet. A long, natural trumpet. But also, the trumpet player's got a chance to compete as well. Now, we don't know exactly how they competed, but you can guess that some of it would be playing louder than anyone else, because that's what brass players tend to do. And also, some of it was playing higher than anyone else, because that's also what brass players tend to do. Now, what we've just found in Greek trumpets, which are called salpenses, they had little tiny holes on them, which could be released with pieces of cotton, which enabled more than one note to be played. So already, four or five thousand years ago, people were looking to play more than one or two or three notes on these instruments. So humans have always wanted to try and play many notes to make music. Now, most of the natural instruments, we have no idea when they were made, but some, like this one here, which is a cow's horn. We know exactly when it was made because it's got a date on it, which you probably can, oh, can we can, almost. <laughs> there we go. There we go, right. So this is from the Colbrook pub, the Hand and Heart, and it was from 1772. So what we see here is a horn that's been added to with, we think, pewter, maybe? Pewter, or maybe pewter. German silver. Pewter or German silver. So it's been added to, to make it look nicer. And it's also got a hole at the end for a mouthpiece. And when you play this, it makes a slightly different type of, type of sound. <laughs> And this could be used quite easily to communicate. Um, we could, for example, say, go to sleep. Um, 
Lenko? Or many other things. So in the Trumpet and Bugle uh, Corps handbook, as published by Her Majesty's Royal Marines, there were 127 different uh, tunes that the army bugler and trumpeter had to learn from memory to make sure that everyone was doing the right thing before the days of mobile phones and telephones. Anyway, so that is the history of brass up to about the mid-18th century, by which time things get really interesting, but you'll have to wait for that. Thanks so much, Tony. That was brilliant. Um, so you won't actually have to wait too long. So next, we're going to explore the evolution and history of some musical instruments and examine how their different sizes, shapes and functions interact with our bodies. So I'm going to hand back over to Tony um, to, to explore some of these evolutions. Thanks much, so much for waiting for such a long time. Anyway, here I am again. Hi, have you missed me? Now, we're going to be talking next about an instrument called the serpent. Now, what is a serpent? Well, luckily, or else this would be a very short demonstration, I've got one here. And you can see that it's a little bit shaped like a snake, which is where it gets its name, serpent. So the serpent is essentially a bass cornet. What's a cornet? Well, a cornet is a woodwind type instrument that is brass because you play it with one of these cut mountains like that. And it kind of works a little bit like a recorder, but it sounds much sweeter and much more interesting than a recorder. And the cornet was one of the most popular instruments in the world, eggs, in the 15th and 16th centuries. And then it kind of died out because it was very hard to play. But everyone played it, from royalty to common shoemakers. And we'd all have a go at playing the cornet. Anyway, I wonder if you want to hear what a serpent sounds like. Yes, I think I do. OK, well, let me play the serpent. <laughs> voices in a choir to help keep them in tune, which is quite a nice idea. But it was quickly realised that these instruments could also give a nice bass to a wind band or even sometimes an orchestra. Now this particular serpent is for me quite easy to play because it kind of fits my hands really nicely and I can sit down and I can play it and everything feels quite balanced. But not every serpent works in quite the same way. So I've got one here. Now this is called a serpent pifo. Now I'm going to play a little scale on it. And while I play a scale on it, I'd like you to try and identify which famous film the serpent pifo is featured in. I say featured. It appears for about five seconds. But, see if you can work out which film is in. But this is much harder for me to play. The span here is much wider and is much more awkward and difficult to play. But this was designed so you could walk around and play it. A little bit like a saxophone, so you could really rock the serpent pifo look. Here's what it sounds like. <laughs> Thank you. 
That is the serpent we cut. So, do we have any answers yet to our question? So does, oh, we have someone saying maybe somewhere over the rainbow. Does anyone have an idea of what famous film yeah, this was featured? To be fair, this film you probably will know if you have people in your house under the age of 10. Sometimes. So, brown kids or whatever. All right, well... What we can do, while you're thinking about it, we can actually give you a hint and we can show it to you. So I'm going to share, share my screen for a second, and you will be wowed by the Serpent Pifo and Shrek 2. <laughs> So I'm not sure if you caught it, but it was there on stage for about two seconds. <laughs> Amazing. So the cool thing is that uh, the Serpent Pifo, someone who made Shrek, thought it was absolutely worthwhile to go and find all these old instruments and animate them so that people could rock out with the Serpent Pifo. Now the number of people in the world who recognised that it was a Serpent Pifo in Shrek you could probably count on the fingers of maybe two hands. But the fact that they did it, I think is pretty cool. Anyway, that's the serpent you and it's much more complicated to hold. The span is much more complicated, and because it's more difficult to hold, it actually is much harder to play. And the history of brass instruments is all about changing things from being hard and complicated being more straightforward and easy to play. As music became more complicated way back in the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, and the harmonies became more complicated, it became ever more important for the bass instruments, especially in the orchestra, to be able to play with accurate intonation. And the serpent can sometimes give you not such accurate intonation. Let me show you. I'm going to play one scale which it likes very much. So it liked that scale very much. I'm just going to change it by literally a semitone, which is the smallest gap in music. So after we have like holes and keys, this instrument has keys on the back, inventors decided to put lots of keys on the instruments, um, up to 12, sometimes 13 different keys, which is difficult when you've only got 10 fingers. And then afterwards, vowels came along, which made it much easier to play, because you can replace all the holes and all the keys on an instrument was just three vowels. And if you've been working down a pit all day, or if you've been working in the fields, or if you've been doing pretty much anything, it's much easier just to move three fingers than have to have the complexity of using all ten fingers at the same time and coordinate that with the lips as well. So in a little bit, we'll go on to even more complicated instruments and how they work with your brain. But for now, that's the serpent. Thanks so much, Tony. I promise you'll have a slightly longer break this time. <laughs> um, so as we've all seen, playing a musical instrument requires some coordination, skill, and in the case of some of those big serpents, uh, it might require quite a deal of physical strength as well. Um, so I'd like to do a very short quiz with you guys, if you're up for it. Um, so it's a very simple A or B type quiz. Um, so I'd like you to guess 
which musical activity requires the most physical energy? Um, so here's the first one. What do you think takes the most energy? A, playing a trumpet in a marching band, or B, playing a flute? So if you think it's A, playing a trumpet in a marching band, you can type A in the chat. And if you think it's B, you can, you can go for uh, playing the flute, B. Uh, oh, I think we're getting a bit of a mixture. A, oh, quite a lot of A's. Yep, so the A's, the A's have it. Um, so playing a trumpet in a marching band does require a bit more energy, burns more calories than playing flute. Um, and I'm going to do one more, and this one is really hard. So <laughs> thanks, Rosalind. Um, so this one's really difficult. So you get five points for getting this one right. So what do you think requires more energy? Is it A, conducting an orchestra, or B, playing a violin, sitting down? Um, oops, sorry, I'm just trying to figure. Um, so which one do you think takes most energy? A, conducting an orchestra, or B, playing in a violin? So I'm struggling to get my, my bats in, in front of the camera. <laughs> Oh, so we're getting quite a lot of A's. Uh, so the answer is actually uh, B. Um, so playing a violin apparently takes slightly more energy than conducting an orchestra. Um, so there you go. But the difference is very, very small. So they're very close, those two options. Oh, there are some super energetic conductors. That's true. I think it must depend on the conductor a little bit as well. <laughs> um, great. Well, thanks. Thanks for taking part, everyone. Um, so as well as being a potential physical workout, we know that musical training can also affect our hearing or how we perceive sound. So some of you might know of, of some famous stories of musicians losing their hearing, and this can happen. Um, but research also suggests that uh, musicians are better at picking out important information from a noisy environment. So they're better at processing um, auditory information. Um, so, for example, a musician might be slightly better at hearing a, a quiet conversation in a crowded pub or in a crowded room, for example. Um, and there has also been some research into the benefits of playing uh, wood instruments or singing for our respiratory system or our lung health. And it's possible that these activities, so playing, uh, for example, a trumpet or a flute or, or singing in a choir, it's possible that these activities help us control our breathing better and also potentially build um, muscles that support the respiratory system. Um, so I just want to give you one example of a, a study on this topic. Um, so sleep apnea is when breathing starts and stops during sleep. And one of the, the main symptoms of sleep apnea is loud snoring. Um, so one study found that people who learned to play the didgeridoo, so that's the, the long instrument played by Aboriginal peoples in Australia, that learning to play the didgeridoo actually helped people with sleep apnea to experience fewer symptoms. Um, so if you if you have a partner who snores, maybe you could or some or a friend, you could maybe suggest they, they take up the didgeridoo, although then you would have to listen to them playing the didgeridoo. So <laughs> it's your choice. Um, but generally, this is quite a, an exciting and also a growing area of research. And we need more studies with with more people in them to really understand these relationships better. Um, but I think it's a really fascinating topic. Um, so we're now going to move on to our final section of the evening, uh, which we've called Music in Action. Um, and it's really focusing on the brain rather than the body now. Um, so playing a musical instrument activates many different parts of our brain and trains them to work together. Um, so Tony, I'd really like to ask you, can you just some of the things uh, that's going on for you in your brain when you're playing an instrument and maybe some of the, the challenges that you, you experience when you're playing. So I'll, I'll hand back over to you, Tony. Thanks very much. That's really cool. Now, one of the things that goes on in your brain when you play an instrument and when you play things over and over and over again, something called myelination. Now, that's when you have synapses in your brain and different pits sort of grow together and then they join to, to so and it says you're going to play a D and you put your right fingers down which is great 
But with myelination, you get a fatty deposit around these synapses, and it makes the brain smarter and clever, yeah. more clever, <laughs> at doing this thing, which is really cool. So when I pick up the serpent, I don't have to think, I know that I want to play a D, and I play a D. And I can make quite a nice noise with it as well. Now, there are some instruments where my brain has to go through another process to make it work. Now, for example, this serpent here, which is made out of metal, which is quite interesting, but it's not the most interesting thing about it. It's got some keys on it. It's got one, two, three, four keys on it. But that's not the most interesting thing. It's got these stays on it here to hold it together. But that's not the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing about it is that it's in reverse. So you can see that this one is the reverse of this one, which essentially means that this is a left handed servant. And it's a left handed military servant which means I have to sit down to play it. So, I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to show you a scale on this instrument, and I think you'll probably hear that my brain is having to work a little bit harder. really well, but the bit in between that is a little bit more complicated. And what I'm having to do is, I imagine a note, and then I have to imagine my hands reversed. So that take, that's a longer thought process. And eventually, if I played that every day for a little while, I would be able to pick that up and just play it. So I spend most of my life playing different instruments. In fact, yesterday I played in one day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different instruments. Um, and each of them had a different technique, each of them had a different fingering pattern. But because I played those instruments quite a bit, I could just literally pick them up and play it and it was fine. Because my brain, with the synapses, the myelination is very secure. So I know that I can pick it up and just play it. And with this, I have to pick it up and translate and then play it. But there are some instruments which take this even further. So this is a contrabass circuit. Which again, luckily, you have to place that there. And here, you not only have to use six fingers, but you have extra keys, and you have to use the side of your hand for one of the keys here. Now, luckily, this key here, the instrument works better if it's left open. So you always have to use your hand pressed down. Now, with this instrument, I'm, it's not only a lot, longer than the normal instrument, so I'm having to think about that. The fingering pattern is completely different, so I'm having to think about that as well. It's also really awkward to play, so physically it's very complicated, so I'm having to think about that as well. And on top of that, I'm trying to make it sound really nice. Now that bit I genuinely play about. So here is what the contrabass circuit kind of sounds like sometimes. So, the second 
like we had a budget in the room as well. So this is so this is my brain having to do four or five different actions before I get to the point of making a sound. Now, for me to play it well, I, I need to spend time, maybe two or three hours, reinforcing the links in my head, and then I can play it. But it's only a short term memory thing that I can play it with. I can't play it and just pick it up after not playing it for two or three months, which is what I can do with other instruments. So that's how my brain, how our brains work. Once things have been reinforced, then you're able to do things really easily. But the brilliant thing is, your brain can still learn new things as you get older. So learning a new skill as you get older in life is a really valuable thing. So I like to think that I will be able to sail into old age, even older age, beautifully, because I'm learning new things every day. So that was the contrabass serpent, otherwise known as George. <laughs> or the anaconda. Or the anaconda. <laughs> <laughs>
and it was made by two cabinet makers rather than by musical instrument makers. And I'm wondering if they weren't a bit jealous of the Birmingham Choral Society. Because you see, in 1842, the Birmingham Choral Society commissioned Mendelssohn to write Elijah for them. And they happen to have a contrabass offered by it, which is kind of like this. But shaped more like a tuba. They had one of those. And I'm wondering if the people from Huddersfield went, oh, well, they can, they've got a contrabass opera. We'll have a contrabass serpent. So I think that might be why it was invented. But Sarah, have you got any views on that? Or is that, am I right there? I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. I think um, in general, we, we believe. I, uh, that the instrument was played in the Huddersfield church where the, the Wood brothers who made it, um, they played the instrument in the church and they also played it in the York Minster. So of those two uses we do know, but why it was made is anyone's guess because it is the only one that has been made. And I think Tony demonstrated why. <laughs> the, the more modern versions of it, um, which are have less keys and actually come with its own holder. So you literally just stand behind it and play like that. And they are less difficult to play. I've played, in fact, I've played all of them now, and they are less difficult to play. One of them has keys which you have to press down to make notes, and the other one has keys which you have to open to make notes. So they're kind of back to front. But they do make a kind of a nice noise. This makes a really nice noise as well, but only when you've been playing it for two or three hours and you really get into the groove on it. That's a really interesting question. Um, I wonder whether we have any musicians in the audience. Um, there are a few hints in the chat that um, people do play musical instruments. Um, and uh, I wonder whether there are any serpent players, perhaps even. I suspect that Chris might be one of them. Um, and here, Susan um, plays recorders and she sings in a choir. Um, Louise has asked a question um, whether the serpent was played in a, a church. That's an amazing question as well. In fact, this is called a church serpent because it was played in churches to accompany the, the voices. In fact, there are quite a few tutor books where the serpent is taught to play plain song like this. And so there, there are quite a few also cartoons, actually, of uh, French vicars playing the serpent. Um, and the, it was always regarded as a, an instrument of hilarity. Just because it looks a bit peculiar, but actually, as you can hear, it can sound really quite nice. But yeah, it was a church, and then it became a military instrument with this, where people used to march along playing it. And uh, allegedly, it was uh, George the Fourth who uh, said it'd be really nice idea for the serpent to turn out a little bit on the bell, so more people could hear it but that's probably not true. Thank you, Tony. Um, we, uh, we have uh, so many musicians um, in the audience. It's, it's quite impressive. Um, there is another question um, about the, the serpent specifically. Um, Heather would like to know how many original serpents um, may still exist. Um, do we know? Do we know? Oh, that's an amazing question. <laughs> Um, More than you think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going. It's probably going to be in the thousands. 
actually, definitely, because they were everywhere, in France, in Britain, they were played in churches in, in, in Britain. Um, they were even mentioned by Thomas Hardy um, as playing in the West Gallery in, in, uh, to accompany choirs, they were played in military bands. In France, they had exactly the same function. They were in Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, even over in America. So they were pretty much everywhere where there was music being made, right up until the time when they died out. And the reason, the only reason they died out is because other instruments came along which were able to do the job better. And actually, if you think about it, if you're in the military playing a, 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 an instrument outdoors, well, having it made of wood is not necessarily ideal. So that's, you know, like brass instruments took off so much for the military. But definitely, I would say in the thousands, I think we've got about 10, maybe? At least, yeah. 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 So that's just here, there are 10. Um, and if you look on eBay at the moment, there's at least, there's definitely one on eBay, even. Um, they want 7,000 euros for it, which is quite a lot of money. But if you want to buy one, there's one on eBay right now. And I'll, I'll just interject as the voice in the room um, that if you're interested in looking up uh, historic musical instruments, there's a website which is called Nemo, and it's a musical instrument museums online, and you can search thousands and thousands of musical instruments which are held in museums. And I can put the link in the chat, and you can even just put serpent in there, and I think you'll be surprised by the number of serpents that are in historic collections around Europe. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Tony. We, um, we have some uh, real experts here. Um, so Susan um, has commented that she's been surrounded by low brass players all her life and used to have a didgeroo, didgeroo um, around here. Um, and an instrument that I don't even recognize is it, um, Sarah, I might need Sarah's help here. Um, Lyserton, um, loan to a horn player friend to play. Uh, so um, quite a range, is it? Lizardine? Lizardine. A tenor serpent, according to Tony. That is, it's confirmed uh, as a tenor cornet, yes. Um, so quite a, quite a range. Um, so now if there are no further questions, um, can we perhaps ask Tony um, for a piece that we can join in? Oh, with great pleasure. Some of those questions, in fact, all those questions were amazing. Some of them are really difficult to answer because we don't know for sure. And that's one of the brilliant things about historic instruments, is we don't know for sure what they sounded like. There is one recording I know of from 1927 of someone playing an opera pie, but that's in a Cuban dance band, which is probably not how it normally sounded. So all we can do is get as close as we can to what we think they sounded like. Now, you've all been asked to provide some sort of instrument. You can either tap the table, you can sing, you can bang a drum, you can play a euphonium, you could get your lizard out, you could do anything like that. But all I want you to do now is just copy this rhythm back to me. Are you ready? No, I'm not yet. I haven't got it yet. Oh yeah, I have got Good. Right. So I'm just going to play this little rhythm for you. Go. Here's another one. Amazing. Fantastic. I'm just going to play two now. Here's the first one. Choose either one of those two rhythms. 
Who better to do? Yes, you can choose either one of those words. And you keep that pulse going. And I'm going to I'm going to accompany you playing on whatever instrument you have on my circuit. Now, if you play an instrument in the key of B flat, as I believe some of you might do, then just play an E or an A. If you play an instrument in the key of F, then just play an A or an E. If you play an instrument in the key of C, just play a D. And if you play an instrument in any other key, good luck. Actually, you know, to be fair, any flat instrument, you just need to play a D. It's fine. Or an A, or an F sharp. So any one of those notes will do really nicely. But let me remind you of those rhythms. But choose one of those two, and I'll count you in, and we'll play a little tune together. To be honest, I'm not sure what the tune's going to be yet, but I think you'll like. And if you don't, it's okay because I can't hear you. Are we ready? One, two, three, go. Thank you, Tony. Um, that was lovely. Um, did I hope that um, people were able to join in? Um, and I will um, hand over back to Judy. Ah, I was going to hand over to Sarah, actually, if that's okay. <laughs> we're just going to pass around uh, who gets to say the goodbyes. So, everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I hope you learned a little bit about some of the important research that's happening at the University of Edinburgh, the connections between how music does benefit both our mind and our body and learned a bit about the serpent this evening too. Um, so as I mentioned before, we uh, would really like your feedback. So look out for that email tomorrow. And also do look at the rest of the events of the Being Human Festival, because there's really interesting things happening. So I hope everyone has a lovely evening and uh, we hope to see you again possibly next year when we do take two. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks everyone, bye.